Well, good morning. How's everybody today? All right. Uh, well, as Jerry said, I, my name is Michael Amatuzo. I'm the student pastor here at our Carmel campus. And I just want to say for a moment that I really enjoy uh, getting to do what I do uh, with the students and ministering to them, loving on them. And parents, I love uh, and thank you for letting me partner with you uh, in this disciple making process with these, uh, with these kids and these students. I love doing that. Um, we've actually been in a series out in GSM called Encounter Jesus. And so the series is exactly what it sounds like. We're just looking at different encounters Jesus has with, with people. And so I kind of feel like I'm just continuing that uh, today. Uh, but first, I want to share a story with you. Uh, when I was, when I was uh, growing up, when I was a little kid, I, I loved going anywhere and everywhere with my dad. So uh, we would go, I remember we would go to the gym, we'd go to the YMCA uh, maybe once or twice a week early in the morning, and I would just love watching my dad play pickup basketball. Um, and we would go, I would go with him if he had to just make a run to the grocery store and pick up a couple things. Or I remember, I don't know why you remember these things as a kid, I remember going to a car dealership as my dad talked to a salesman to buy a new vehicle, and um, that was a really boring trip. But it didn't really matter what it was. If it was fun or exciting, if my dad invited me to go along and I was able to, I wanted to go with him. I just wanted to, to be wherever my dad was. Um, and while those are great memories, I also have some traumatic memories with my father, um, one of which I called him up uh, this week as I was writing, and I said, hey, do you remember this moment? And he was like, I don't recall, recall that at all. And I was like, okay, well, obviously this wasn't traumatic for you, but it, it was for me. Uh, we, were, we were in, I think, like a Sam's Club and I was maybe five or six, and as a six-year-old, um, Sam's Club is just huge. It's ginormous, right? And I'm walking with my dad, and I can remember him saying over and over again, son, stay close to me, don't wander off. Stay close to me, don't wander off. Michael, stay close to me, don't wander off. Over and over and over. And as a six-year-old, you're like, why does dad have a stuttering problem? Like, he just keeps saying, now I know as a dad of an almost six-year-old exactly why my dad repeated himself so many times, um, because it just doesn't get through the first 10 times. And so he's saying, just, hey, don't wander off, stay close to me. And I don't know if I wandered off or didn't stay close to him. All I know is I got distracted, and when I looked up, I didn't know where my dad was. Um, and in that moment, I was terrified, and I was frightened, and I was scared, and you would think maybe the next logical thing to do is shout and call for your dad. Well, one thing you may not know about me now is that growing up, I was a very quiet and shy kid, especially in public, and so the last thing I was going to do is start shouting. Instead, I just begin to cry and wander the store looking for my dad, just like a little puppy who just like had nowhere to go. And I was, and I was, I was sad. I didn't know what to do. And what felt, it felt like an eternity. I'm sure it was just a few moments. Uh, it felt like an eternity, but then I finally found a store associate and they asked me for my father's name and I told him, they called him over the loudspeaker. And in that moment of just wandering the store, I just wanted my dad to be with me. In that moment, I was just like, I just want dad to be here. Um, and I was so excited to see him and to be reunited with him. But I wonder, have you ever had those moments uh, growing up or, or maybe even now there's a project or something you're working on and you're just like, man, I wish dad were here right now. And I know not all of you have a great relationship with your father. Maybe some of, some of you um, had a great dad. Maybe some of you had a not so great dad, but maybe you've had that moment before where you just wish dad was there. And I just want to say, if you've had a great relationship or a horrible relationship with your dad, it's okay, because that just means he was human, and he's not perfect, and he's flawed, um, and we all are. But today, I want to remind you, and I'll show you in a story, that we have a Heavenly Father who is perfect. Um, he's not flawed, and he is ever-present with you, uh, and he promises to be with you uh, in times of trouble or whatever it is. And so if you have your Bible, why don't you uh, open that up to John chapter 6 this morning. Uh, we are continuing our series uh, called Grow, and as the name implies, the purpose of this series is we want to grow in our relationship with Jesus uh, in 2022, and we're going to do that by, by studying through the Gospel of John here on Sundays, uh, at home throughout the week, and also in your connection groups. Um, and so most of the year, we've been working verse by verse through John. 
Uh, last week, you may remember, we looked at an incredible miracle. You guys remember the feeding of the 5,000? And as Kevin reminded us, uh, it was probably more like 15,000 because John describes 5,000 men besides the children and the women, right? And so Jesus does this incredible miracle um, where he takes five loaves of bread and, and two small fish, and he shows compassion on the crowd, and he feeds them until they have had their fill, uh, until they were fully satisfied. And maybe you remember that, that Kevin pointed out that there was, there was a goal um, here in, in, this, in this miracle. Jesus wanted to do more than just meet the physical uh, need of these people, right? There was, there was an internal hunger that, that everyone on this earth has, and Jesus knew that. And so he didn't just want to meet their, their physical um, needs, their temporary needs. Um, and I love this about Jesus. Even as we're studying through uh, these different stories in, in our student ministry, I just feel like this has been highlighted. Like, God, you had, you had so much more planned and prepared when you were doing these miracles here on earth. We were, we're wowed by them. The people were wowed by them. But you had an eternal purpose in everything that you were doing. And I think sometimes as Christians, we get this wrong, but Jesus really helps us understand, like, yes, we need to meet people's physical needs, right? We need to, we need to meet people where they're at and they have physical needs and we need to, we need to help them. But if we don't ever uh, help them understand their eternal need, um, then like in this story of the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus would just be feeding a bunch of dead people who, who, have, who have no hope. And so Jesus wanted to offer hope. He had an eternal purpose for them. And I believe that we should emulate that. We should, we should model what Jesus modeled for us. Well, today we're going to pick up right where we left off from this massive picnic that just took place because John 6, starting in uh, verse 16, it happens immediately after uh, everything we talked about last week. But before we go any further, uh, let me pray. Father, I thank you uh, for your word. Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you for uh, everything he modeled for us here on this earth. But most of all, uh, Lord, I thank you um, that you didn't come to just offer um, a temporary solution, but an eternal solution for us. God, thank you for meeting us where we are at and, and uh, meeting our spiritual needs. Lord, I, I pray this morning your Holy Spirit would speak to us. It would convict us. It would challenge us. You would encourage us. Father, I pray that you would give us the power to grasp your love this morning. And we pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. All right, John chapter 6, starting uh, in verse 16. It says, When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they, were, uh, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. I want you to, to remember Jesus is not with them in this story, okay? Jesus uh, had not yet joined them. And this body of water that John is referring to here, this lake, is the Sea of Galilee. And one thing we need to know about the Sea of Galilee is that it was uh, situated 680 feet below sea, lo sea level, surrounded by hills and mountaintops, okay? And, and so what would happen is, one, it was a beautiful sight to see. One moment, things were just beautiful and gorgeous as you looked out over the Sea of Galilee, but the next moment, because of, the, because of the, all the hills and the mountains, a, a storm could just kind of blow through and everything could change. And as I was studying through this story and, and, and just kind of discovering some of these things about the Sea of Galilee, I thought, isn't that a great metaphor for life? Isn't that how life works sometimes? Everything is spectacular. Everything's looking up. Everything is beautiful. And then you receive a phone call or a text message or an email or your, your, your doctor calls you into the office for some unexpected news or, or your boss calls you in and suddenly life just kind of gets turned upside down. Uh, and that's what's, that's what's going to happen here in the story. That's what the Sea of Galilee was like. So it's dark. The disciples have, they've started off into the water and a windstorm pops up. It says a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. How many of you in here are storm chasers? Any storm chasers in the room? Anybody watch one too many, uh, you know, like Weather Channel specials and you jump in your minivan anytime there's a storm and you're chasing it? No, none of those. How about basement runners? Any basement runners? You remember a few weeks ago when our phone went off in the middle of the night, um, and some of us uh, probably got our whole family up and we ushered them to the basement. Other others of us were like, "Oh, it's Indiana weather. It's fine. Like I'll just go back to sleep." You know what? I'm some of you are in here. Um, um, but how many of you went out on the patio to watch the storm unfold? Okay, you're crazy. No, no but like here's the, here's the deal. Storms on land are one thing. Okay, right? Storms on land are one thing, but storms out on the water 
are a completely different kind of crazy. And I, I, I want to remind you that the, the disciples who are in this boat, most of them are fishermen. Okay, so, so most of them, they've been out on, on, on a boat out in the water most of their lives fishing. They, they've encountered windstorms before. This isn't something new to them, but this storm that they are in, uh, this windstorm, it's not just any storm. They're, they're in a desperate and helpless position. Look at verse 19. It says, they had rowed about three or four miles. And you might think, well, that's no big deal. Three or four miles. Okay, they're making progress. But this small detail that John adds, uh, it may not seem like much, but there's, signif- there's, there's, there's uh, something that, that's missing, and, and we find it in Matthew's gospel. And, and today we're going to look at some of Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel to kind of piece some things together that, that John left out. But in Matthew's gospel, we, we learn uh, that he informs us that this happens during the fourth watch of the night. So during like three to six in the morning. So these disciples, they set out, they have been rowing the boat for six to eight hours hours, and they've only made it three or four miles. And by the way, this is only about halfway across the lake. Okay, so they, they are exhausted. Uh, this is no small storm, and they're, they're beaten down. They're worn out. They're, they're spent. But I think there's an important lesson here to learn, um, is that we, we will all go through storms in life, just like the disciples are going through here. Um, and that following Jesus doesn't actually exempt any of us from experiencing storms in life. These disciples went through them and, and we'll go through them. And maybe for some of you, you're in a storm right now. There's something going on in your life right now. And I don't know what that is. It could be, it could be a job. It could be something going on with that. It could be that you are waiting for answers uh, about your health and it feels like you're kind of out on the sea getting <laughs> rocked around. You don't really know um, what's going to happen. Maybe some of you are going through rough waters in your marriage right now. Maybe some of you are single and you're asking, God, is, is he the one? Is she the one? Do you even have anyone for me? Is there anyone fit for me? Um, maybe it's family stuff that's going on in your life right now. Maybe that's with your kids or, or with your in-laws. Maybe you and your spouse have been trying to get pregnant for years and, um, and you're not able to. And because of that, it's creating tension between the two of you and maybe even a lack of faith in God. Maybe it's a friendship at school that's falling apart or just a friendship in general and you feel like you're not making any progress. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Um, what are the storms that you're facing? And maybe you're asking, why am I in this storm in the first place? Why do I have to go? Why do I have to go through this? I wonder if the disciples were asking those questions uh, when they were in the middle of this, because these guys were close to Jesus, right? They were literally walking with Jesus. Um, They knew him personally. Why would Jesus let them go through something like this? And I think all of us ask questions like this uh, when we're going through storms. Um, Where do storms come from? Well, I I think there are at least three reasons why uh, we face storms in life. And the first is this. I think sometimes storms are our own fault. I think sometimes they come as a result of our own bad decisions. Parents in the room, you, when you parent your kids, you understand this. Sometimes bad things happen for your kids because they make bad choices and bad decisions. The same thing's true with us. Sometimes we make bad choices and bad decisions and we bring these storms on ourselves and their consequences of the choices that we've made. Sometimes storms come from our enemy. Satan is real. Satan is real. He's as real as I am standing here on this stage today. We have a real enemy, and his mission is really clear. It's to steal and to kill and destroy. And so maybe the storms that that you're facing are because of him. But other times, I think we face storms simply because we live in a broken world. Our world's not perfect. It's, It's broken. It's sinful. And another small detail that that Matthew and Mark include in their gospel accounts, but John does not, is that Jesus actually ordered his disciples to go on ahead of him and cross over the lake. Jesus says, go on ahead of me. And then he goes up to the mountainside to pray. And you know what that tells me? It tells me that you could be following Jesus. uh, You could be completely obedient and in step with Jesus and still find yourself in the middle of a storm. And that's what's going on for these disciples. We live in a broken world filled with sin. But I do want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that in Revelation 21, if you're a follower of Jesus, it reminds us that a day is coming. A day is coming where there will be no more pain and there will be no more tears and there will be no more suffering. That God is going to take uh, the broken pieces and put them back together. God is going to make all things new And even just 10 chapters later in in John's gospel, uh, he's going to record Jesus saying, in this world, 
you will have trouble. Storms will come. You're going to experience them. You will face them. But he goes on to say, take heart for I have overcome the world. But for the disciples, they're lost in the middle of the storm. They're, they're in the middle of this massive windstorm in the middle of the lake, and they're exhausted, and they're scared, and they're not knowing what to do next or how they're going to get to safety. And then look what happens next, John 6, verse 19. It says, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. Here comes Jesus walking on the water. And, and it's all, it's, I wish I could see it, you know, because Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. So here's this man who's literally walking on the water. And Jesus is doing exactly what Jesus has done before. He's making seas into highways, except this time he hasn't parted it to walk on dry land. He's walking on the water. And this is the second showing of Jesus's deity in, in under 24 hours right? Because just less than 24 hours earlier, Jesus just did this amazing thing, feeding the 5,000s. But the disciples' response to seeing Jesus out on the water kind of strikes me as odd. I don't know if it does for you. It says that they were, they were frightened. They were scared. They were terrified. Why? I like, wouldn't seeing Jesus bring some sort of comfort? Like, oh, there's Jesus. Thank goodness. I'm like, isn't Jesus the Prince of Peace? Why are they terrified? Well, once again, if we look uh, back at Matthew's account, we actually find out why. Matthew 14, 26 says, when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. The The disciples, they were so caught up in fear and probably frustration from rowing um, and not really getting anywhere that they didn't even recognize their own savior approaching the boat. It's a ghost. They said it's, it's something out there in the distance and they didn't know they were, they were just afraid. But what does Jesus say to them? He says, it is I, don't be afraid. He says, take courage, take heart, don't be afraid. But here's a question for you and I to wrestle us. Why shouldn't they be afraid? I mean, why shouldn't they be frustrated? Why, why, I mean, wouldn't you be frustrated if you were in this situation and you were in the middle of a storm, especially a storm that you didn't choose or ask for, especially a storm that God sent you out into the water? He's the one who told you to go. I mean, why shouldn't we be afraid like the disciples were afraid? Does God know something that we don't know? Well, the answer is yes. God, God sees things we can't See, he knows things we never will. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His his ways are not ours. Isaiah says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways above our ways. For example, in the gospel of Mark, we actually get a beautiful example of uh, an insight of what Jesus was up to on this mountainside. In Mark 6, 47 through 48, it says, later that night, The boat was in the middle of the lake and Jesus was alone on land and he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. It says he saw the disciples. Jesus was watching. Even though the disciples felt like they were alone in the middle of the lake, they weren't alone. Jesus had never left them. He was always watching There are two reasons I believe that we can take courage and not be afraid. Those words that Jesus offers them, I think he offers to us as well. When we're facing storms, um, I think there, there there are two reasons why we can be encouraged. And the first is this, you are in the storm, we are in the storm with his presence. We're not alone. If you're in Christ, you will never be alone. God's presence promises to go with you and to be with you. And if you're in situations right now that you don't wanna be in, I want to tell you today that you are not alone. You're not alone in that. You you may be in a storm right now, but you are in that storm with his presence. On the hills that surrounded the Sea of Galilee, Jesus could see every, every part of the lake. The whole time the storm was brewing, Jesus was watching his disciples. And at just the right time, he determined that it was time to move in closer. I want to tell you, if you're in the middle of a storm, Jesus, he sees you. He sees you where you are, and at just the right time, he's going to draw near and remind you that he is close. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, he's always with you, even in the storm right now, or if today things look beautiful and great, and tomorrow a storm comes, God's going to be with you. 
A psalmist, I think, says it beautifully when he says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 139 says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Deuteronomy 31, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord, your God goes with you and he will never leave you nor forsake you. No matter what you're up against, no matter um, how desperate it may seem, God is with you. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to turn his back on you. His presence is with you. And the second reason we don't have to fear, especially if you are in step with Jesus and you are following him and you are obedient, then you can be confident you are in the storm for his purpose, right? Jesus knew exactly what he was doing um, when he sent his disciples off ahead of him. Jesus, he did that for a reason, right? Jesus wasn't making a mistake. He didn't make mistakes. He knew exactly what he was doing when he sent them off ahead. But I do wonder, what was Jesus praying up on the mountaintop? What did he go up there to pray? And, and I'm tempted to believe he was praying for his disciples, that maybe he was asking uh, his father to increase their faith and their trust in him. And we can't know that for sure, but either way, I do believe Jesus was using the storm to increase the disciples' faith and dependence in, in him because that's what Jesus modeled. I mean, Jesus himself said that he does nothing he, or he does only what he sees his father doing, right? And, and, and Jesus, uh, he wanted that kind of faith for his disciples and that dependence. And I think he wants that for us too. But even if it wasn't to increase, increase the faith of all of the disciples, it was certainly to increase the faith of one of them. Here's another detail that John doesn't give us, but Matthew does. Right after Jesus tells his disciples, don't be afraid, one of, one of his disciples, Peter, calls out to him. And we never really know what Peter's going to say when he opens his mouth. <laughs> but Peter here says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out to you on the water. What do you think of Peter's request here? Like, are you encouraged by Peter's faith? Or, or maybe you're taken back by his audacity to ask this of Jesus in this moment. But I think Peter looked out at Jesus and he thought, I want to do that. Like, I want to be like Jesus. I want to do what he's doing. So Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out on the water. And Jesus graciously responds and says, come. And then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Peter got out of the boat and for a moment he's walking on water. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and I wonder, has this ever happened to you before? Have you ever taken your eyes off Jesus just for a moment and you, see, you feel that feeling of like, I just feel distant. I feel far from, from him. And that's my story that I shared earlier, just for a moment, right? My dad kept saying, stay close to me, stay by my side. And for a moment, I got distracted and I looked away and I was scared and I was frightened. And in, in a moment of distraction fear, uh, uh, of fear, Peter, he lost faith and he doubted. And for many of us, I think this is how we remember the story, if we've heard it before. We think about poor Peter. Peter doubted. Um, he's often remembered as the guy who failed to walk on water because he took his eyes off Jesus. What a failure. But as I was studying the story, I thought, was he a failure? Like, did he fail? I mean, he was the only disciple that made an attempt in this moment in this boat, right? Peter was the only one who called out to Jesus. His request and his boldness actually gave him an opportunity to experience the power of God like he had never experienced it before. And Peter may have been a little impulsive in stepping out of the faith as Peter is impulsive in a lot of his responses, but he did it in faith. Even though his faith was young, he knew, he knew enough about Jesus. He knew enough about his savior to know what he was capable of. Less than 24 hours ago, he just witnessed something incredible Jesus did. And so his faith may have been childlike and impulsive, but it was pure. It was trusting. And I wonder if it's about time for some of us, for some of you, to take an impulsive step of faith like Peter did. To take a step, a childlike step of faith towards Jesus, just like Peter. Maybe part of what God wants to do in your life today through this story is increase your faith and your dependence upon him today. 
And I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe, maybe that looks like taking a step of faith in giving of your time and your, res- your resources and your finances for him. Maybe that looks like taking a step of faith and praying. Maybe you, you've lacked in the area of praying because you've lost faith. Maybe it's, it's asking for the power to be overcome your disbelief, or maybe you need to take a step of faith and break off an inappropriate or unhealthy relationship that you're in. Maybe it's taking a step of faith of giving your marriage another chance or extending forgiveness to someone else. Maybe it looks like just handing all of your worries over to him. Maybe that step of faith is, is getting baptized here in a couple weeks. Maybe you feel God tugging at your heart to do that, and, and he's calling you out of the boat. Maybe it's to confront a friend in the sin that they're, they're struggling with. Maybe it's to talk to somebody about Jesus, to share your faith with them, to share the love of Jesus and the gospel with them. Maybe it's the step of faith that looks like giving him all of your anxiety and your fears. Or maybe it's one of the most difficult things sometimes is taking a step of faith to asking for help, asking somebody for help. Or maybe that step of faith is actually putting your faith and your trust in Jesus for the first time today. I don't know what it is for you, but whatever it is, I want to encourage you, however he is drawing you to take a step of faith out of that boat, would you do that today? Will you, will you step out of that boat and will you go to him? And maybe you say, I've tried that before. Or what if, what if I fail? That's a great question. What if you fail? Because you might, you might fail. You could. You could fail. There's no doubt about it. But also, just like Peter, you might get a chance to walk on water you might have an opportunity to experience God in a way you haven't before. One thing I know for sure is if you stay in the boat, you're going to miss out on something extraordinary that God has for you. Peter had faith for a few seconds, but then reality hit him, and he realized that he was walking on the water, or maybe his friends in the boat distracted him, and they were like, dude, you're walking on water, and he was like, yeah, oh my goodness, I am. And then he became fearful, and he began to sink. And in that moment, he took his eyes off Jesus. But did he fail? I mean, is that actually failure or is failure, does that look like never getting out of the boat in the first place? Maybe failure looks like the rest of the disciples who sat there and did nothing. You know, I I even wonder, maybe that's why John didn't include it in his gospel. That moment of just like, I didn't have that faith that Peter had. And Peter may have had 11 guys sitting in the boat saying that he was crazy. But here's what I know. I would much rather be out in the raging sea with Jesus than in the boat without him. And I think that's what Peter had. I would rather be out there with you right now, Jesus, than in this boat without you. Look what happens next, Matthew 14, 31. It says, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. It says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And Peter took this step of faith, even though he doubted and even though he lacked faith, guess who was always faithful? Jesus. Jesus was there to catch him. And because of his impulsive or his childlike faith, he got to experience something that none of the other disciples got to experience. And I think there's a lesson there for us that even when we step out in faith and we fall or we feel like we're failing and, 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 we, and we feel like we, we don't have enough faith, guess who's always faithful? Jesus. And he he was more than sufficient to pick Peter up, and he's more than sufficient to pick you up. And this means if you step out in faith um, and you fall, or maybe you're in a storm right now and you feel like you're falling or you've already fallen, Jesus is there to pick you up. Now, I want to go back to John's gospel uh, as we close today, because what John records in verse 21 is miraculous. It says, then they were willing, after all this, they were willing to take Jesus into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. They received Jesus into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore. They were were in the middle of the lake and suddenly they reached safety. And I think there's a gospel message in this. The moment you receive Jesus, everything changes. The moment you receive Jesus, the moment they took Jesus into the boat, they were safe to shore. But I think this is also why, why Jesus meant all of this to, or all this to happen to increase the disciples' faith. Because uh, Jesus could have got them to shore at any point. Right? We know in Matthew's and Mark's account that Jesus was watching them the whole time. 
He watched them struggle. He let them struggle. Why did Jesus let them struggle? I think he wanted to display his goodness, his power, his efficiency, his faithfulness. He wanted his disciples to experience the struggle, to experience the storm, to remind them he's present with them. That he's always present with them. And Jesus required of the disciples, of what he's always required of the disciples, and it's what he requires of us, is just faith. He wanted them to have faith and believe, I'm present, I'm with you, I've got you, I'm, my eyes are on you, he sees you. And in Matthew's account, as all this wraps up, it says that those in the boat worship Jesus, saying, truly, you are the son of God. When people get out of the boat, when people take a step of faith, amazing things happen. What if everyone in here today was to say, I want to get out of the boat. I want to do what Jesus is doing. I want to take a, a bold step of faith. Can you imagine the kind of power that would be released in our community? Can you imagine what God could do with a church like ours, the way that he, we, could, we could impact our friends and our coworkers, our neighbors, our, our fellow students, our schools? What kind of influence would we have if we were stepping out in faith like Peter did? And it may just turn out that some of the people um, who, were, who were one minute saying, you idiot, you need to get back in the boat, are the same people who see you doing things and experiencing God in a way you've never done that before, walking on water will say, truly, Jesus is the Son of God. Look, the boldest step that anyone has ever taken in history is when Jesus stepped out of heaven and came to earth. The Bible tells us that Jesus was with God, that he was God, and at the right time, he took on flesh and he came to earth to dwell among us so that we could be rescued from the penalty of our sin and the penalty of eternal death. Jesus has more um, to offer than just temporary solutions. He has an eternal solution for us. Jesus lived a sinless life, yet he died a criminal's death on the cross for you and me. And with it, he took all of our sin and he took all of our shame and he buried it in a tomb. And when he, he was raised three days later, the sin didn't go with Jesus. It was buried. And when we are in Christ, we're washed white as snow. And we're actually given the righteousness of God. God looks at us and says, you are right. You are made right with me now, not because of anything you did, but because of everything that my son has done for you. And that's why I think it honors God when we take steps of faith towards him. That's what he asks of us when we take steps of faith towards him. So I just want to say one more time, if you're in the middle of a storm, wherever you are, or whether things are great today and the storm comes tomorrow, Jesus offers you the same words he offers his disciples. Take courage. Storms will come. Take courage. Don't be afraid. His presence will go with you. Let me pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. God, thank you that you loved us so much that while we were still sinners, you sent your son to die for us. That Jesus, who knew no sin, who was sinless, he took on the sin of the world for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. Thank you, thank you for that. God, would you encourage us today? Would you remind us wherever we are, whether it's taking a bold step out of the boat today or simply being reminded that we uh, that you are present with us. That we would, we would be reminded to just put our faith and our trust and our hope in you. Faith in you today, faith in you tomorrow and the next day. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would have your way today. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.